Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop, which is, by the way, what he's doing right now, selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at WallStreetWindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. WallStreetWindow.com all right, y'all. Welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. And our first guest on the show today is our friend Phil Giraldi from, uh, well, lots of things. First of all, he's the executive director of the Council for the National Interest at councilforthenationalinterest.org. And he's also a contributing editor at the American Conservative Magazine and at uns.com. That's U-N-Z, uns.com. The latest one here at the American Conservative Magazine is Turkey Cooks the Books in Syria. Welcome back to the show, Phil. How are you doing? I'm fine, Scott. How are you? I'm doing good. Appreciate you joining us on the show again. Uh, and good one here. Um, now, I like to point out all the time that uh, back on December the... I can't ever remember if it's... Oh, it's the 8th, because it's not the 7th, because I'd remember it was Pearl Harbor Day. So it must have been the 8th of December uh, 2011. You published a piece at... Antiwar.com called Washington Secret Wars. And in there you said Obama has signed two new findings, uh, both of them ramping up covert activity uh, by the CIA and I guess whoever else, um, one against Syria and the other against Iran. And then, But I often forget, although I did know this at one point, that you had a companion piece to that in the American conservative right around the same time came out a few days later where you elaborated on that quite a bit and in fact it seems like now that you mention it broke the story of the arms pipeline from Libya to Syria yeah that's correct I uh, I basically uh, at that time the American conservative was still uh, doing a print edition and that's where it appeared uh, so it wasn't online yeah. and of course anti-war was online and it was a somewhat different story uh, more so about the findings but the mm-hmm. The fact is that the um, uh, I picked up uh, from sources in the Middle East uh, that these weapons were being shipped off to uh, uh, to the, to Turkey to be used in Syria, and this was in December of 2011. So, uh, yeah, we had the story a long time ago. Nobody paid attention to it. Uh, now Seymour Hersh has has revived the story and come up with a lot of corroborating um, information. And uh, interestingly enough, the mainstream media is sort of ignoring him about it, too. Uh, it just shows that if a story runs against um, uh, how the mainstream media perceives its role, it's not going to report it no matter what you do. Right. Well, now, first of all, I forgot to mention that you're a former CIA officer and former DIA officer, and uh, that's why it is that you're so plugged into the intelligence community, what they think and what they know and what they say and that kind of thing, and you've broken many original stories in the past as well. Um, and yeah, it's an important point, isn't it, how here Fox News, man, they don't ever stop crying about Benghazi. Now, don't tell them that that was just one day, and that, in fact, America waged an entire war for the jihadists uh, that Fox News supported at the time back in 2011, but man, they don't ever quit about 20, uh, uh, 9-11, 2012 there, and the sacking of the consulate, makeshift... Uh, pseudo consulate there and the killing of ambassador stevens and here seymour hirsch hands them cooperation of their own one of their own previous scoops too on a silver platter but they don't run it because they hate him <laughs> and so yeah, even yeah, though he's exactly telling their happening. version yeah. their narrative they don't want to hear it from him yeah I, I, I you know when when the when seymour's uh, uh story broke about two weeks ago i was thinking you know why god this finally has come out and of course he added a lot of new information about what the turks were up to which is the focus of the piece i have over at the american conservative today but the uh the fact is i said this is dynamite and it appeared in the london review of books uh it was picked up in a few places but you know the story has kind of died and i'm, I'm thinking this is this is really an important story because it it shows that uh if you take obama and uh and and uh i hesitate to say bleach him a little bit and you got george w bush uh it, these guys are doing the same things they're they're starting wars covertly uh, they're engaging in regime change in the Middle East. Uh, they don't seem to get uh, 
the message at a certain point that uh, this kind of stuff has not worked for us very well, and uh, this stuff goes on and on and on. Yeah, well, you know, there's a silver lining to it because, uh, you know, if they did tell us the truth, they might make things worse there, but they've just completely ignored what's gone on in Libya since that war. It's almost like it never really happened, um, other than that one day in Benghazi that they never stopped talking about. Um, yeah, but yeah. you know, for those and, of and us paying Benghazi attention, we we yeah. Seen... And to point out the Benghazi story is the wrong story. I mean, uh, you know, I think you, you would have a difficult time making the case that the, the government deliberately screwed up or covered up or anything like this. But the whole thing was a misguided operation to do the wrong thing and to to be delivering weapons to a an insurgency that you knew nothing about. So they missed the big story. And they're talking about the little story in an attempt to show that Obama and his and the people around him are nothing but screw ups. Right. Um, and then, but meanwhile, they mostly, at least, ignore. Uh, certainly, they ignore uh, the way that the Libya war uh, blew back and and weapons spread and jihad and ultimately uh, a Western further Western intervention this time by the French uh, took place in Mali because of the war there. Um, and mm-hmm. then you had all these weapons. Uh, you know, that uh, they're shipping off to Libya. And, yeah, when you say the wrong thing, I mean, what you're talking about really is backing al-Qaeda, guys. I mean, the when the Libyan Islamic fighting group existed as a force in Iraq, they were called al-Qaeda in Iraq. They were considered, they were the Zarqawiites, any of the, mm-hmm. right, of the, the foreign jihadists that came to fight in that war. That's who these guys were. And, in fact, That's I thought right. Rachel Maddow actually did the best job right off the bat on the Benghazi story in saying that, remember Sheikh Alibi, that George Bush and Dick Cheney tortured into pointing the finger at Saddam Hussein, that eventually um, Gaddafi murdered for us in prison there. Well, his brother was murdered, Sheikh Yahya Alibi, was uh, killed by uh, Obama uh, by a drone strike in Pakistan in June of 2012. And then right before the anniversary of September 11th, Zawahiri put out a podcast saying, uh, you know, dear Mujahideen of Libya, the Americans are dumb enough to have surrounded themselves with you. Well, here's one of our guys, one of your guys who they murdered, and it's time for you to get vengeance against them for what they've done. And Obama and Hillary had literally put an American base in the center of an Al-Qaeda hornet's nest. I mean, they couldn't have... They couldn't have believed their own BS uh, worse, whatever. It seemed like to me that she had the most plausible explanation for what really led up to that attack in the first place, even though that is still just the one-day event. It, it, it illustrates the fact that, yeah, the wrong thing was fighting for al-Qaeda, not just in Libya, but then saying, that worked so well, we need to export the damn thing to Syria and carry on. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of it. I mean, the thing is, they, they you know they they fail to see that that uh, that creating these very complicated schemes to to basically interfere in other countries where. First of all, you don't really understand what's going on in any serious way, and second of all, you don't understand the players that you're supporting. And so they do. They, they get into this thing again and again and again, and they never seem to figure out that there's something fundamentally wrong with the way they think. And, and uh, so we here we see this terrible situation with hundred uh, at least a hundred thousand dead civilians in Syria playing out. We were the major uh, instigators of this event. And we were the ones feeding the insurgency without any understanding of who we were feeding. So it's, you know, it's this kind of thing that you just kind of sit back and you say, well, yeah, I mean, when is this going to end? And when is George Bush and, and Barack Obama going to be in the International Court uh, of Justice in The Hague and sent away to prison for the rest of their days? You know, it's just it's just so astonishing. We've become the evil empire, and, and it's kind of a, a terrible thing to think of in terms of your own country. But I, I, I don't know, you know, what to think about these people anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing. There's a big difference between the land and the people and the politicians in charge of this thing here. Uh, hopefully we can continue to, to uh, you know, um, uh, discriminate. I mean, the, the truth is that the people agree with these kind of policies less and less now make more and more of a difference. So you can, you can hate your government and still love your country, Phil. Don't worry. But, okay, well, yeah. thanks, Scott. 
Uh, you know, well, I mean, hey, it's a big deal to me, too, because uh, I sure hate them, but I'm from here, and I don't hate my neighbors. Um, I disagree when they agree with my government, but I, don't, I, I hold it against the politicians is all. But anyway, so now let me ask you about this. I know that you're helping um, – uh, over there at, at uns.com, and you guys have run this series by Patrick Coburn, which I would continue to urge you, I would urge you to continue to run pretty much anything that that guy writes about anything. Um, and he wrote this five part series about the next generation of Al Qaeda. And I've been talking to you for, geez, eight, nine years now on the radio, something like that. And from the very beginning, you've been saying, look, just ramp this whole thing down. We're just making more terrorists. It's time to just cool it and support for their movements will dry up and that kind of thing. And yet now, uh, I'm reading Patrick Coburn and he, he's not prescribing a solution necessarily, but the picture he paints almost sounds like too late. American hopelessly anti Geraldian foreign policy this last 10 years since you first recommended they start doing the right thing here um, has created thousands and thousands of new, young, angry, armed, American armed bin Ladenites from Mali throughout the Levant and into Iraq where they've started the civil war back up again and I can't help but imagine that this is going to really be the excuse, a war on al-Qaeda still, after uh, the next few absolutely horrible attacks by them happen, is going to be the excuse for decades more of war against these guys. Because Bush and Obama have succeeded one way or the other in empowering them by the thousands and thousands and thousands. It's this whole new generation. Or what do you think of what he wrote there? Well, I, I read the, those articles with a great deal of interest. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's a guy who's very plugged in, and he has a very independent way of thinking in terms of how he looks at problems and how these, these issues develop. So uh, he's always worth reading, as you noted. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I've been arguing for some time now that the, uh, the whole uh, the concept of international terrorism has been overblown, that people have been exaggerating. But I, I, I tend to agree after reading his, his pieces that, uh, if anything, we have revived it. We have, we have taken this movement, which was out of the defensive almost everywhere in the world and in decline, and we've given it new life by what we've done in, uh, in Iraq and in Syria. And it's, uh, it's quite an astonishing thought that, uh, you know, we scream all the time about terrorism and the terrorist threat, and we are probably the ones uh, in a, assisted by our friends, the Saudis, uh, who have done more than anyone uh, to create the terrorist menace, and it is indeed a menace that has found new life, I think, in Syria. Yeah, well, back to Syria in one second, but and maybe this is stupid because it's by Eli Lake, but Eli Lake is saying today at the Daily Beast that jihadists now control a secretive U.S. base in Libya that the special forces have built there to train anti-terrorist forces. They were raided once and all their equipment stolen, and so the Americans abandoned the base, and now it's a al-Qaeda training camp, which I don't know if they're working, if these are pro- or anti-American al-Qaeda this time, Phil. We probably don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, they're the moderates. No, 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 these are the extremists. Well, it's hard to tell. They're trying to split off the Nusra from the ISIS, you understand. All right, well, now, and so, now back to Syria, but back in time. Let's go back to 2011 here. I actually just read an apologia for Saudi intervention in uh, Syria at the national.ae that said that um, it wasn't until after Assad's obliteration of Homs in 2012 that the Saudis began intervening there and arming up the Al Nusra Front and uh, and ISIS, etc. And um, and yet, uh, in your article, I mean, first of all, as we already we started talking about, it was at least by the end of 2011 they had these operations going on. Um, but you also point out in your article at the American Conservative Magazine that. Uh, Robert Ford, the American ambassador, was out there in the streets and encouraging the protesters and picking sides and uh, maybe financing them, etc. Uh, remind me now, was that early in 2011, the summer, the fall? Or, or what do you know about how this really started, the American inter and Saudi intervention there? Well, the Saudi intervention is, is a separate issue, and it goes way back. 
uh, the Saudis, as you point out, were were after homes, and they were out for uh, Assad the Elder. They basically this is this this is essentially because Syria was perceived as being uh, uh, the wild card in the Arab deck that it uh, essentially had uh, uh, interesting relationships with Iran. Uh, it uh, it also was a secular state. Let's remind ourselves, which uh, the Saudis are not terribly keen on. Uh, and uh, the Sunnis were not in control, which uh, another thing the Saudis are not keen on. So the Saudis go way back. The United States really got into this um, uh, around about 2003 or so, and it, it was a combination of factors. It was, Israel had input into this. Uh, Congress, as usual, got into it. Uh, the Bush administration um, was was basically uh, looking at Syria as yet another Arab domino, and we've been playing a clandestine role and an overt role. Now, this is this is where it was always interests me, and this is what you're talking about, uh, a la Victoria Newland in in um, in Ukraine. Ukraine, where we send over we sent over a series of ambassadors and charges uh, who essentially were uh, were there to stir things up and they did a lot of that and Ford was doing this I think it's I'm not sure what month but it is two, 2011 I'm not sure exactly what month uh, he was involved it's uh, it would be easy to look it up on the internet but the uh, uh, he was going to meetings um, just like uh, our ambassador in Russia was doing our ambassador in Ukraine has been doing uh, with opposition figures supporting the um, the opposition openly uh, on, on a couple of occasions Ford was actually uh, uh, pelted with tomatoes and rotten fruit, uh, and then it was finally decided to pull them out. But the embassy was still there, and the embassy's second in charge is his charge A, uh, deputy chief of mission, and uh, they were doing the same thing. I mean, they were basically stirring the pot, stirring the pot, stirring the pot. So this is something that we see now, uh, in retrospect, as a pattern for U.S. behavior in these other places and in, in, with countries that we, we don't approve of. Yeah. And you know what? I don't think it's, uh, you know, the same uh, to say that, yeah, and you know what? It has drawn out this war. As you mentioned before, it's got, uh, you know, created all these refugees and all these terrible casualties. Um, and it, the war may not have ever broken out in the first place and or the Sunni insurgency in Syria may have been crushed by Assad. And that would have been a lot more peaceful, the, the peace of the stamping boot, I guess. Um, for them, but I don't think it's necessarily to say that that would be preferable to this isn't necessarily to side with the Alawites against the Sunni Arabs of Syria or anything. I mean, they, they do have the right to resist and to declare independence, to secede if they need to or whatever, just like any other group of humans. But, uh, you know, the facts on the ground of what has actually happened here is that it's really just another Bay of Pigs, right? It's really just another Shia uprising from 1991 in Iraq where the Americans yeah. encourage them and then leave them high and dry to be slaughtered. And it serves yeah, our well, interests. You know, what's interesting about them. this is, is, what's interesting about this is none of this stuff is the proper role of an ambassador. An ambassador is there to represent the American people. He's basically there to help Americans in trouble, to help American businessmen who are traveling overseas, to uh, serve as a channel for uh, getting the views of the country that he's representing, that he's that he's in, back to Washington uh, for policymakers. He's not supposed to be a CIA officer, you know, running around stirring things up. And yet we've lost sight of this. And and we're we're basically perverting the whole function of uh, of diplomacy uh, because we don't understand it anymore. And it's it's like so many other things that we're we're just kind of we become so used to being the uh, on steroids Goliath, you know, walking across the world with all our nuclear weapons and our armies and and ships and and airplanes that we don't have any kind of uh, perspective anymore. And this is what I think is kind of scary about all this stuff because you see if you see ambassador after ambassador after ambassador, both under Bush and under Obama, going overseas and basically serving as advocates for the political opposition in those countries, what kind of reaction do you expect to get? Right. Yeah, and also, as you've written before, too, they're all a bunch of incompetent boobs who do nothing but create disasters everywhere. They have no idea. It's not like, I mean, I don't know if Alan Dulles ever really was good at this stuff either, but 
At least we could pretend that back in the good old days they were good at this stuff. Now they're just completely horrible at it. You know? Well, they have no perspective on the world. I mean, that's the whole problem. These are the, these people that come up through the systems are, are apparatchiks, as the Russians would call them. I mean, they're basically uh, creatures of the system, and that's all they understand. They understand how to make the, uh, the whoever the guy in the White House is smile. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just, it, it, we have a, we have a country that's become totally corrupted by, by our politics and our money and this kind of thing. And we don't, don't really understand anything anymore. I don't think you've, you know, even our neighbors like Mexico and Canada, I mean, do, do any Americans really understand what's going on in either of those places? I, I, I doubt that. Yeah. No, I mean, they certainly don't explain it on TV. That's for sure. Um, yeah. All right, so now let me ask you about what you think of Hirsch's report. You buying it? Uh, yeah, I think on balance I do buy it. I uh, yeah, because there's there's corroborating information that he didn't talk about in in his story, uh, which I outline in in the piece I did. Mm -hmm. um, basically, he's saying that the Turks uh, got themselves into a corner on Syria, which is no surprise. Uh, and essentially, they tried to force Obama uh, into attacking Syria because uh, he had unwisely declared that there was a red line of the use of chemical weapons or weapons of mass destruction on civilians. So the Turks, uh, seeing this and understanding this, arranged this. They basically worked through their own uh, friends in the insurgency, and they supplied them with the chemicals, and they supplied them uh, with the means of delivery, and so on and so forth, and and essentially created this incident. Uh, I believe that. I, I uh, it's more plausible than anything else I've heard. I know for a fact, and I've said this a number of times on your show, um, that both the U.S. and British governments know for a fact that Syria did not initiate the attack that was being used as a casus belli. Uh, to attack them, so uh, you know this is this is a highly plausible account of of what may have occurred. I think since uh, Cy Hirsch, I know him personally, uh, generally is a very reliable reporter, has very good sources in the Pentagon, intelligence community, and State Department. Uh, I tend to believe that this is correct. Um, and then I would throw into the hopper the fact that uh, there was this just before the recent Turkish elections, there was a recorded. Uh, conversation between uh, Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey and his head of intelligence in which they were basically talking about how to get this thing going basically by staging a false flag attack on their own soldiers. Right. So, you know, this is the kind of uh, cynicism um, that prevails in that part of the world. And uh, so, I, yeah, I believe it. On balance, I believe it. Yeah, well, and by the way, for folks who don't know or forgot, um, uh, you know the Turkish intelligence guys because you were a CIA officer stationed in Turkey for many years, right? That's right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, I, and I know them. They're very tough people. They're capable of doing what they think they have to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I'm not surprised at any of this. And, and there have been some arguments, oh, the Turks could never pull off anything as complicated as that. Well, that's nonsense. The Turks are quite capable of pulling off something like this or something even more complicated. Hmm. Well, you know, I think it's important that um, your reaction and also Flint Leverett and Ray McGovern, uh, two former CIA analysts, and uh, Patrick Coburn, the I think the best Western reporter in the Middle East that we have uh, out of all of them, if you had to rank them, uh, all y'all's reaction has been, yeah, that's Seymour Hirsch for you, man. He does good work, always has, and, and check out... The, all the other reasons that we already know that this fits with, you know, uh, who had the motive, what we already know about the CIA analysts' unwillingness to go along. Oh, let me ask you about this, because um, Ray McGovern said that uh, the uh, Brennan had CIA guys there in Turkey who knew about this, too. And that, yeah, uh, yeah. Didn't do it. Yeah, there's no question that this was known to the American intelligence community. I was hearing this, uh, as was Ray, uh, quite early on in the process when they were cranking up to attack Syria. Uh, we, you know, we knew it. We were we were we were told it by by uh, people who had, you know, pretty good access. Let's let's leave it at that. But the uh, the sure, yeah, there was there certainly were lots of people in the CIA that that knew that this was phony. 
and and from the get go. That's really something. Else. Not just the analysts didn't believe it, but the as as right. McGovern put it, Brennan's men, the operations right. guys, they knew from the get go it wasn't correct. You're saying that's correct. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we got to run. Thanks again, Phil. Great to talk to you. Okay, Scott. Bye bye. Bye. All right, everybody. That's Phil Girali. He's at theamericanconservative.com and the Council for the National Interest org. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new project, Listen and Think Audio at listenandthink.com. They've got two new audio books read by the deepest voice in libertarianism, the great historian Jeff Riggenbach. Our Last Hope, Rediscovering the Lost Path to Liberty by Michael Meharry of the Tenth Amendment Center is available now. And Beyond Democracy, co-authored by Frank Karsten of the Mises Institute Netherlands and journalist Carl Beckman will be released this month. And they're only just getting started. So check out listenandthink.com. You may be able to get your first audio book absolutely free. That's Listen and Think Audio at listenandthink.com. Hey, you own a business? Maybe we should consider advertising on the show. See if we can make a little bit of money. My email address is scott at scotthorton.org. You hate government? One of them libertarian types? Or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers? Me too. That's why I invented libertystickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. Libertystickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck.